Well, let's bring in our political panel to discuss this a little bit further. Now, Liberal MP Tim Wilson joins us from Melbourne. Labour MP Josh Wilson joins us from Fremantle in Western Australia. Welcome to you both. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. So let's talk about this framework that's been outlined for us. Now, we know that the Prime Minister has um, outlined this framework and is hoping to be able to get to stage three by July. States and territories, however, will have the option to pick and choose through this framework to see what would actually work for them in relation to their infection cases uh, as they rise or decline. Josh Wilson, don't you think that this would just add some more confusion to the general population? Well, it doesn't need to, and let's hope it, 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 that doesn't occur. I mean, I think it's good that we have these stages outlined as part of a, a national process, and that coordination and cooperation at the national level has served us very well. Uh, but as we saw uh, through the, the period when we were first responding to the crisis, there's going to be some variations uh, state by state around the country, uh, as is appropriate. My state of Western Australia uh, took some different approaches, and, and that's worked out very well. We've managed the crisis uh, excellently here. Mark McGowan uh, and the Health Minister, Roger Cook, have done a great job. So I think we will continue to have uh, a sort of a, a broad shared plan, but there will be variation. I think that's OK. Tim, there was a bit of a different emphasis between Daniel Andrews and Scott Morrison in regards to these restrictions yesterday. Scott Morrison saying we can't hide under the doona forever, whereas Dan Andrews said that we can't let frustration get the better of us. Morrison also called this a roadmap, whereas Dan Andrews called this a menu for states and territories to pick and choose from. Are you comfortable with allowing for states and territories to implement this differently? Not that you have a choice in the matter, but are you, are you comfortable with the way they might do that? Oh, resolutely, yes, because firstly, I'm a federalist um, and uh, I believe that we should uh, have local laws and reflecting local conditions. But the other reason is because it puts the burden and the responsibility on the states to actually explain why they've taken the different approaches. Now, uh, taking the point that Josh has just raised, uh, you know, WA has done things differently. They let kids go back to school earlier, whereas Victoria is saying no. The, uh, the burden and the responsibility then has to be on Dan Andrews. Why, you know, when other states are allowing uh, people to go and visit their mums on Mother's Day, why can't we go and visit in Victoria our mums on Mother's Day? Why can't we send our kids to school? Why are businesses being unnecessarily punished uh, longer than in other states? And he has to come out and articulate that case and take responsibility for it. Although last weekend we did see some tension arise between Victoria's Premier and uh, Dan T and the Education Minister, the Federal Education Minister, Do, are you confident that Federal Ministers will just allow for states and territories to, to implement the, these restrictions and lifting of them as they see fit? Well, it's up to the states to decide how they're implemented, but it doesn't mean that other people can't have opinions. I've just outlined some serious questions I think that Dan Andrews needs to answer uh, for Victorians if he wants to maintain public confidence. Because I think, and there is actually now a narrative that's building in parts of Victoria where people are increasingly concerned that he's probably enjoying the clampdown too much in terms of the authority and power it's given him, and he's not as enthusiastic to roll it back. So um, people will have their own opinions, uh, but I think it's up to the burden of responsibility to the states to articulate what stage they're implementing, why they're implementing it, backing it up with hard evidence and making the case uh, for further easing of restrictions when they come along. Uh, Josh, you know, you mentioned a little bit earlier on that uh, WA's record in terms of trying to deal with the pandemic has been pretty good so far. I think you've just broken your eight-day streak of no infection so far. You've got just one infection now. Just looking at these three stages, obviously WA is a lot further down the line. What would you like to see implemented sooner um, of all these three stages in WA? Well, Fazia, they've, they've got to be done in in the right order. Uh, we've begun uh, that process already to some degree. Uh, schools um, are back and the, the attendance at the schools has been pretty good. It makes sense now to expand uh, the size of, of gatherings uh, that people can enjoy. That's very important, I think, for the inter at the interpersonal level and the way that people uh, have dealt with the crisis. Everyone has shown an enormous amount of forbearance and discipline. And of course, we we look forward to being able to 
um, see one another and participate in um, outdoor activities with more people and perhaps enjoy uh, going to cafes and other businesses. But it does have to be done slowly and carefully. Uh, the health management of, of the health issues needs to remain the highest priority. Uh, and we, we need to also remember as we go through these early stages that as far as the, the economic impact, the very severe economic impact, uh, there's a long way to go. And some of, I'm very mindful in my community that, that some of the, the parts of, of the world here in Fremantle and more widely in WA that were hit first and hit hardest, uh, artists and, and uh, cultural and creative workers and people involved in events uh, have basically had their livelihoods completely ripped away. And for them, uh, recovery is still a long way off. We need to do it together. We need to do it cooperatively. I can tell from some of the remarks that Tim's making that there's there's been a bit of a breakdown in cooperation consensus in Victoria. That uh, does take two to tango, uh, and and certainly what we saw from Dan Tian last Sunday wasn't helpful. Uh, if it if it becomes a case of finger pointing between uh, the federal government and the state government in Victoria, that's not going to be helpful, and that will lead to confusion. Tim Wilson, on that note, I just wanted to pick you up on a comment you made earlier about Dan Andrews enjoying this lockdown because of the power that it gives him. Are you sure you meant to say that? Well, I think if you actually go and look at some of the commentary in the press, in the Victorian press today, other people are saying that. That's why I draw attention to it. Is that because... what you're saying? Uh, well, I, I, I'm looking at it and saying Dan Andrews yesterday came out with a press conference and for no compelling reason, no evidence base, uh, simply said, we're not lifting the restrictions and I'll give you a press, release, a press um, uh, report on Monday. Isn't You're that what New South Wales is doing as well? And isn't that because well, New I, South I, Wales and Victoria have both had much higher cases than other states and territories? There, there, are, there are, of course, issues that are specifically related to the state. But uh, what he has done is not given articulation. That's what I've said right from the outset. Victorians are frustrated and that should not be the terms on which decisions are made. But that does not negate the obligation, the responsibility of the Premier to come and outline uh, the plan he has for reopening the state and why there is such a substantial difference. You're right, there are breakouts in uh, New South Wales, but people are still able to go and visit their mum on Mother's Day. You're allowed to have uh, more than one person within a home in other states. In Victoria, that's still all no go. It's not a breakdown, it's a simple request that, that the Victorian Premier, Dan Andrews, actually articulates the reasoning behind his decision making. Josh, what do you make of this? Do you think it's a power play on the point of Dan Andrews? Well, you know, Tim's responsible for his own comments. I find that pretty strange. It seems to be here we are. It's, uh, it's the weekend after Dan Tian uh, went on television and had uh, an absolutely bizarre and inappropriate crack at the Premier of Victoria, who I think, like Premiers around the country, has done a pretty good job. Um, Tim's now accusing Dan Andrews of of being on a, on a Josh, power trip. Josh, that is false and in, you, that, is you, relation, that is wrong. I've made the in, observation in of what's in Victorian press and you need to actually go and read the Victorian press. I understand WA, that may not be the case, but the front page of the Herald Sun today is very clear, wanting to understand the rationale, the reasoning behind why Dan T... Uh, why, uh, Dan Andrews is not reopening Victoria as other states are doing. It's a simple request for information, and people are reflecting what is the rationale. Tim, you've got the uh, you've got the dustpan and brush out now, my friend. You've, you've, not at you've all. You've come on. You've come on, and you've chosen to to draw attention to a particular concept, which Sun. is which you've chosen to use as as a sort of a, a prop. Presumably, I can't see in order to accuse Dan Andrews of being on a power trip. Last Sunday it was Dan T and today it's Tim Wilson. I just don't see how that's good for the people of Victoria, but that's your business, my friend. All right, we might have to leave that topic there and bring you to our second topic, which is about the Banking Royal Commission and the federal government is delaying implementing those findings of the Banking Royal Commission for six months because of the coronavirus. Tim Wilson, could you tell us exactly why that needs to happen? Well, the reality is the banks are obviously focused on supporting people uh, during the period of uh, the coronavirus. But in terms of legislative reform, because the parliament hasn't sit, a lot of the financial institutions, including the banks, are waiting for legislation to come out of the parliament to implement it. So that's the basis. Uh, Josh, do you think that this is the cover, perhaps, for not doing anything uh, in terms of the banking reforms? 
Well, as, as Tim said, we're in the middle of a crisis and I think we'd want banks and financial institutions to be focusing on serving customers and businesses. So to some degree, it's understandable and, and Labor's approach will be um, supportive and reasonable about it. But let's just remember, this is important now and it'll be important in the future. The coronavirus can't be taken as cover for um, the past inactions and past failures of the current government or mm. of future inaction and future failure. Uh, the reason the parliament hasn't got through this is because the government has dragged its heels. And before that, the reason we haven't got those changes is because the government said there was no need for a royal commission. They voted to block it 26 times. So uh, mm. it's always better to fix the gutters when the sun's shining. There are some big systemic and cultural problems in Australia's banking and finance services industry that should have been addressed. They haven't been. We know that in times of crisis, uh, that those are precisely the circumstances in which systemic failures and cultural failures actually uh, cause people real harm. It's that those things could have been fixed by now, uh, but they haven't been. And I think it's just a probably I would say as, as a local member who's been supporting businesses with exactly those issues, mm. uh, that the, the banks at the same time as they're out there saying the right thing and running yep. Uh, ads that the banks are very good at running that fill us all with it, make us feel positive right. towards them. They do need to focus on right. on supporting customers and businesses at this time. We're just running out of time. Uh, Tim, I'd like to let you have the last say on this or a reply. Well, the, the focus of the banks does have to be on making sure that we uh, they're supporting customers. And we know that uh, in some cases, some banks aren't. ME Bank, mm. which is owned by the industry super funds, uh, has been taking uh, money out of people's offset accounts and uh, prepaying mortgages without uh, their people's notification or approval. So these are the sorts of issues that do need to be considered. But the legislative response to the Royal Commission is focused very much on what we need to do to address systemic problems. Uh, and banks need legislation for clarity and certainty and interpretation to make decisions and then to change their own policies and practices. Until that's done, uh, many of the organisations simply can't uh, do uh, what they need to do. So the only focus is on how we make sure we get the outcome we need, but also making sure that financial institutions support people during this difficult time. On that note, we're going to have to leave it there, unfortunately. Um, thank you so much for being with us, Josh Wilson and Tim Wilson. Thank you. Thanks.